<laughs> Thank you so much for the introduction and especially for the invitation to speak in the distinguished hall to a distinguished audience in memory of the distinguished former director, Francesco Calval Seralder. It adds depth and resonance to the series to have his name attached to it. Well, the artists on whom I have been honored to be invited to speak were the greatest interpreters in their age of the Gospels in art. This distinction has all the more meaning because their time and place, the European 17th century, was the last era when Christian subject matter was regarded as the highest function of which art was capable. In that sense, we can say that Pedro Paul Rubens and Rembrandt Harmens van Rijn were the last of the great Christian artists. My talk covers a lot of ground, and I hope to be able to help you keep track of things with this little outline that I, I put up and which will be uh, going through subject by subject. And you'll also be able to see how close we are to the end. It's well to realize that in the 17th century, the Low Countries, where Rubens and Rembrandt came from and worked, dominated the European art world. <clears throat> More than one in three artists born before, between 1600 and 1670, whose names are in the encyclopedias of art, came from the northern or southern Netherlands. The landscape of the European art world in that time looked like this, with the front and rear peaks being the southern lowlands, today's Belgium in red, and towering over all the rest in brown, the northern Netherlands, now the Kingdom of the Netherlands. The country is also sometimes called Holland, but the Dutch government decided last week that it was going to avoid the use of the name Holland, which only applies from strictly to two provinces, North and South Holland, and everyone has to call the country now the Netherlands. The uh, branding people and the uh, uh, people in uh, publicity are not all that happy with it, but uh, I will stick to that now. So we call the Southerners Flemish and the Northerners Dutch. These artists did not work only at home. Dutch artists swarmed all over northern, central, and eastern Europe. The Flemish worked widely in France and Spain, and everybody came to Italy. Everywhere they went, they took with them the fame of the great heroes of their schools of art, Rubens and Rembrandt. Before examining some of the images, Let's have a look at the larger political and religious context in which the artists worked. Rubens in the Catholic Southern Netherlands, or the Spanish Netherlands, Rembrandt in the Protestant North. This factor is, of course, of great importance for understanding the role of devotion in their pictures of the gospel. The parents of Rubens and Rembrandt were born in a country that consisted of 17 provinces. The Rubenses in Brabant, the Van Rijns in Holland. All were subjects of the King of Spain, at that time Philip II. As head of the House of Habsburg, he attempted to preserve not only political unity in his empire, but also religious allegiance to the Catholic faith. Both aspects of his rule became a cause of fateful irritation in the Low Countries. The aristocracy and the city fathers felt that he was encroaching on their historical rights 
and Christians who were converting to one of the new Protestant churches or the other came into conflict with Philip on grounds of belief. In the 1560s, the situation deteriorated so badly that war broke out between the Spanish rulers and the Netherlandish rebels. The seven northern provinces succeeded in forming a government of their own, the United Province of the Netherlands. The southern provinces and Luxembourg remained in the Spanish Empire. In the Netherlands, only Protestants were allowed to occupy political positions. In the southern provinces, only Catholics. <laughs> there was a difference in the uh, degree to which uh, these issues were forced. In the north, Catholic churches were allowed to exist as long as they didn't look like churches from the street. In the south, Protestantism was suppressed much more vigorously. By the turn of the 17th century, a de facto division had come into being along lines that to this day mark the boundary between the Netherlands in the north and Belgium in the south. The only big differences lie in northern Brabant and Limburg. Can I use this to see uh, here's Limburg is now part of the Netherlands and Den Bosch and this part of Brabant uh, has been lost to the, uh, to the Spanish Netherlands. For a long time, rulers and populaces on both sides of the border continued to think of the 17 provinces as one country. In map, map making, a delightful convention took hold that projected the territories of the Low Countries onto the outlines and features of a proud tiger, the Leo Belgicus. <coughs> Some of these maps showed the country to be ruled by Catholic princes and churchmen on the left, and the others, the same map, is shown to be ruled by the cities of, of the Netherlands and the farmers and townspeople. <clears throat> the division between the northern and southern Netherlands, which was finalized in 1648 at the end of a war that lasted for 80 years, promotes all kinds of easy simplifications. For example, the map I just showed you on the left with a two-color code of the 17 provinces could also be covered, colored in this way with 10 colors, highlighting subtle and not so subtle differences between polities. As for religion, I wasn't able to find a color-coded map earlier than 1849, but this gives you something of an idea of the earlier situation as well. The north, with a continuation through the middle, is solidly Dutch reformed. Can you see this? Oh, yes, okay, on the screen. This is Dutch Reformed, and the South is solidly Catholic. But in the west of the country, in the provinces of Holland and Utrecht, we see a mixture of uh, considerable divergence. Look at all that dark green for Catholic in those provinces. And the red actually looks too unbroken. Among the Protestants, there were numerous denominations, ranging from lenient to strict, from conservative to liberal, from dogmatic to free thinking, from highly organized to very personal. Many of the Protestants were refugees from the South, who still had relatives in the Spanish Netherlands. Denominational breaks within families were more the rule than the exception. After all of these complications, let me show you a super simplified explanation of events. In 2018, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam had an exhibition on the 80 Years War, and they were good enough to explain it in 80 seconds. The 80 Years War in 80 seconds. 
Let's go back in time 450 years. The Netherlands are part of the Spanish Empire. The King of Spain, Philip II, says everyone has to be Catholic. The Dutch rise up in revolt. It starts with the Bilden Storm. Soon afterwards, the first fighting breaks out. From that moment, chaos reigns in the Netherlands. The rebels are led by William of Orange. The Dutch start fighting each other. Catholics and Protestants drive each other out of their homes. It's civil war and it's brutal. Een protestlied doemt op, het Wilhelmus, en dat is nu nog steeds een top The Dutch kick Philip out of the country. The northern provinces form an independent republic. The Netherlands is born. The north splits from the south. The north gets incredibly rich. The Dutch golden age has begun. Piet Hein captures the Spanish treasure fleet. The Dutch attack Spanish and Portuguese possessions all over the world. The war almost turns into a world war. In 1648, everyone makes peace again. The Netherlands becomes independent, and we're still enjoying that freedom today. Want to take your time finding out more? Hurry along to the Rijksmuseum. So, there you have it. Now, several important aspects of the art of Rubens and Rembrandt came forth out of the religions of their countries. Most obvious is that Rubens painted a great number of martyrdoms and altarpieces for Catholic churches of a kind that Rembrandt did not. Although it is fun to tell you that near the end of his life, Rembrandt did get a commission from the Sauli family in Genoa to paint an altarpiece of the Assumption of the Virgin for Santa Maria in Assunta in Carignano, a church of which they were donors. The oil sketches that Rembrandt set, sent have been lost. <laughs> Next time you're in Genoa, keep your eyes open. They might still be around somewhere. But I have projected his early ascension of Christ onto a photo of the place in the church where the finished work would have come into uh, to, to hang. So Rubens, Rembrandt could also have become uh, the painter of an altarpiece in a Catholic church. Some of the gospel subjects Rembrandt painted, drew, or etched were never pictured by Rubens, but there was nothing in them that prevented him from having done so. Today I will concentrate on three gospel themes that were depicted by both artists, which provide the most illuminating comparisons. They are the descent from the cross, the elevation of the cross, which comes later for a reason, and the adoration of the Magi. We will be looking for correlations between faith and form, for the relation between devotion and emotion. To what extent was Rubens' Catholicism determinant for his imagery and Rembrandt's Protestantism for his? How did each of them deal with the emotions of their figures, with their own emotions and those of their viewers? Our starting point is in Rembrandt's studio with the work and writings of his pupil, Samuel van Hoogstraten. He provides us with a rare pair of quotations that put into words values and attitudes that have essential functions for our artists, as we will see when we move back in time. Towards the middle of the 17th century, in Rembrandt's studio in Amsterdam, an interchange took place between Rembrandt and his gifted pupil, Samuel van Hoogstraten. Samuel had been working on drawings of the crucifixion of Christ with his mother Mary sitting or lying on the ground at the foot of the cross. As Samuel's instructor, Rembrandt took a pen to hand and showed him how to improve the effect of the Madonna at the, at the foot of the cross, or in this case, also to uh, show her posture in a more uh, poignant way. The figure of Mary, although seen from the back, was underdeveloped. The contours of her head and arm needed to be fortified. On the brush drawing, recommend, Rembrandt recommended a repositioning of the figure. We can imagine from inscriptions on other drawings corrected by Rembrandt what kind of discussion would have taken place. Here is a pupil's drawing 
with a manuscript comment by Rembrandt reminding the pupil that the heroine of the story is a high-born lady and that when she left her parents' home, all the neighbors would have come out to watch. When it came to the crucifixion, Rembrandt would have told his pupil to imagine what the persons at the scene were feeling. That would have applied more than anyone else to Mary. How would a woman feel seeing her only son at a young age being executed in such a painful way? How would she give expression to her feelings in her body language? Rembrandt and Van Hoogstraten wrestled with the problem. In neither of these drawings is a definitive solution presented. This incident around 1650 stayed in the mind of the pupil. Samuel van Hoogstraten was a writer as well as an artist. He wrote one of the most important books on the art of painting of the Dutch 17th century. It came out in 1678, the year of his death. As he was writing, an upsetting communication reached him. His brother Franz told him about a completely contrary opinion concerning the Virgin at the crucifixion, an authoritative opinion that condemned Rembrandt's take on the matter as disrespectful, nearly blasphemous. In 1676, Franz, who was a publisher, translator, and writer, had translated a text on devotion to the Virgin with a vehement page on the sins of artists against the Mother of God. <clears throat> the writer was the senior Catholic ecclesiastic in the country, Johannes Baptista von Neerkassel. That Franz von Hochstraten translated his book was not just a professional job. Although he and Samuel had been brought up as Mennonites, Franz had a sympathy for Catholicism that grew stronger with the years. The book he translated from Latin was titled A Tractate on the Honor and Service of the Saints, and most of all, The Holiest Virgin Mary, translated into Dutch for the instruction of Catholics and un-Catholics. That's the word he uses by FVH, which was Franz von Hofstraten. Although Neerkassel was considered a moderate who stood open to interconfessional exchange when it came to images of the Virgin Mary, he lost his cool. I'll read this to you. Standing beside the cross, Mary demonstrated the exceptional constancy of her exalted temperament. Be astonished by the elevated soul of Mary. Despite her immense pain, you see in her no powerlessness, no inappropriate bodily gestures, no tearful misery. You see her sad, but not gloomy. She grieved out of motherly affection, but with becoming distinction. Her maternal belly ached without in the least affecting her clear mental state. Her virginal feelings were touched by the wounds of her son, but her spirit remained unmoved, the spirit with which she loved and worshiped divine justice and compassion. For she knew that the travails of Christ were destined to be an instrument for the salvation of mankind. Saint Ambrose knew this when he said, concerning the death of Emperor Valentinian, that Holy Mary stood beside her son's cross and the Virgin saw the pain of her only born. I read, wrote from Neerkassel, that she stood, not that she shrieked, and elsewhere, Mary behaved with no less aplomb than befits the mother of God. The apostles fled, but she stood by the cross because she was awaiting not the death of her son, but the redemption of the world. And so von Neerkassel insists on the deeper theological meaning of the event rather than the feelings, the human feelings of those involved. And then he goes on to talk about painters. Many of them do injustice to Mary, as do some books and sermons. For these reasons, it is apparent how unworthily those painters or printmakers treat Mary when they depict her as losing control of herself. 
showing the women around her and even John the Evangelist engaged in bringing her back from a fainting spell and how justified the zeal would be of those bishops who in support of Mary's honor would cast any such, such pictures or images out of the church. He's calling for a veritable act of iconoclasm. Samuel von Hochstraten was stung. Here, one of the most valuable lessons he had learned from his cherished master, one of the sources of his pride as an artist, was being undermined in no uncertain terms. He did not take it lying down. In his own book on painting, he turned to the issue in the most important section of the main chapter, dealing with the emotions and passions in history painting, including Bible painting. In this connection, he wrote, I simply cannot go on without telling how we painters are accustomed in scenes of the bitter passion of Christ to depict Mother Mary as the one closest to the Savior with the greatest emotion in our power. Usually this means having her faint and fall unaided into the arms of the other Marys. Great masters have considered this to be not inappropriate and we have followed their example. However, a certain Johannes, now appointed by his people to be Bishop of Utrecht, asserts in a particular tract that this feminine tenderness does not befit the proud and highly enlightened virgin who had taken it upon herself so thoroughly to suffer with patience all that befell her at the hands of God. This sharp confrontation, which is really rare to find, I was delighted to be able to, come to find and to tell you about these quotations, which put into so many words issues which are often simply unspoken. They posed against each other the two factors <clears throat> that are the subjects of this talk devotion and emotion, and they have a denominational divide. <clears throat> For Johannes van Neerkassel, devotion is all. <clears throat> to him, depictions of sacred subjects that do not conform to the principles of Catholic dogma <clears throat> are insults to the faith and have no right to exist. Samuel van Hoogstraten proceeds from the artistic primacy of lifelike emotion, with adherence mainly to the biblical narrative, the character of depicted figures and their interaction. If this approach is associated with Protestantism, it would be in keeping with the prescript to honor the Virgin, but not to worship her, whereas von Neerkassel, of course, called his book the honor and service of the Virgin. When Hochstraten wrote about great masters considering it appropriate to maximize the emotion of the Madonna at the crucifixion, he was undoubtedly referring to Rembrandt, thinking about his lessons in those student drawings. But he might have been exaggerating or shouting down his own doubts because when we look at Rembrandt's own images, we find that he was anything but sure about how Mary behaved on Golgotha. In the early 1630s, Rembrandt created several compositions showing, in the words of Hochstraten, Mother Mary at the bitter passion of Christ. Three of them depict the descent from the cross, a traditional iconography that follows the letter of scripture fairly closely. The four evangelists all tell the story the same way. On that faithful Friday, Christ was put on the cross at nine o'clock in the morning. At noon, the sky went dark until three o'clock when the earth trembled, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, and Christ gave up the ghost. Sometime later in the day, a member of the Jerusalem town council who was a follower of Christ, Joseph of Arimathea, went to Pontius Pilate who had ordered the crucifixion to take place to ask for the dead body of Christ. 
When his request was granted, he bought a clean linen cloth, took down the body, covered it, and moved it to a rock-hewn tomb. The only discrepancy between the text and Rembrandt's images lies in the remark by Matthew, Mark, and Luke that the women who followed these events stood at some distance. But an artist could call on the authority of John, who wrote, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. As you may have noticed, while I was reciting these events, there was one big difference between the three compositions, and that concerns the depiction of Mary. Looking more closely, we see that Rembrandt was undecided about how to show her. In the painting for Stadtholder Friedrich Hendrik on the left, she lies flat on her back, apparently in a faint, being attended to by Mary Magdalene and Mary Cleophas. In the etching, which reproduces the painting faithfully in every other respect, the cloth on which the Madonna lay in the painting is now empty, seemingly to be used for the body of Christ. If Mary is in the picture at all, it can only be in the figure between those two here, seen only in uh, the hood of a garment. And in the later studio painting on the right, of which the composition was surely by Rembrandt, the mother of God is standing, but has passed out and is being held up by others. Detail for detail shows the radically different ways Rembrandt pictured the Madonna while the body of Christ was being lowered from the cross. Here in a dead faint on her back, here hidden between the other figures at the crucifixion, and here standing and having fallen faint. How will he have explained to himself how he felt about the Madonna's reaction to the crucifixion? In a small etching of Mary at the foot of the cross, made toward the end of this period, Rembrandt opts for the first solution, showing the Madonna fainted and fallen unaided into the arms of the other Marys, or at least one. <clears throat> Others of those present also gave vent to their despair. However, it would be a mistake to think that this was Rembrandt's final decision on the matter. In two etchings of the 1650s, he once more displays indecisiveness. In the descent from the cross by torchlight on the left, Mary seems to be lacking altogether. In the majestic three crosses, she is seated on the ground with the other Marys, not in a faint, but with her hands clasped in prayer. This image comes closest to the ideal projected by Nearcastle. Returning to Rembrandt's first work with Mary on Golgotha, oh, I'm sorry, I'm missing a section here, the descent from the cross. Uh, let's broaden the scope of our inquiry to the function and destination of the work. It was painted for the highest official in the Northern Netherlands, Prince Frederik Hendrik, the Stadtholder, the commander in chief of the armed forces. I hardly dare tell this in Madrid, but the painting was paid for in part by Spanish gold. In 1628, the Dutch captain, Piet Hein, we saw him in the film, captured the Spanish fleet, bringing an entire year's supply of silver from the New World back home. The prince got a considerable part uh, of the take. To add insult to injury, Rembrandt stole the composition of his painting from an artist who was a diplomat in Spanish service. Peter Paul Rubens was secretary of King Philip's Privy Council of the Netherlands. There he is. When Rembrandt undertook that composition, 
He, his patron, and his patron's advisor were very well aware that the best known painting by Rubens, I'm sorry, here it is. The best known painting by Rubens, the central panel of the altarpiece of the Arquebusiers Guild in the Cathedral of Our Lady in Antwerp, was a descent from the cross. An artist in that position had to make one of two choices, either to try and bypass Rubens and come up with a creation entirely different from his, or else to adapt Rubens' composition and acknowledge the debt openly. That Rembrandt and the court went for the latter option was nearly inevitable, since if he had tried to ignore Rubens, everyone would have thought of Rubens anyway. The purpose would have been defeated, and there would have been a lot of explaining to do. Emulating Rubens' composition opened a much nicer conversation, the kind of comparison by connoisseurs of the two works with room for praising Rembrandt without having to put down Rubens. A print collector might have been pleased with himself to recognize that the man leaning over the top bar of the cross was closer to a woodcut by Albert Aldorfer than to the Rubens. Rembrandt had already started in his young years to collect the prints that would become a major resource for his art and the source of delight. Looking at the Madonnas in the compositions of Rubens and Rembrandt, we seem to have a textbook confirmation of Johannes von Neerkassel's thesis. Rubens shows a self-contained and dignified woman in complete possession of herself. She was the vessel of Christ's incarnation as a human by his birth from her womb. She is now participating in the culmination of his time on earth. While Rubens' Mary suppresses her motherly instincts to help effectuate the salvation of mankind, Rembrandt's has collapsed forlornly into the arms of her helpers. I must say, walking through the galleries of the Prado this afternoon, that von Neerkassel was actually being uh, too strict in the sense of counter-Reformation value, uh, values, because earlier Catholic paintings of the Virgin at uh, the crucifixion, like the great Rohir von der Weyden altarpiece, does show uh, the Virgin collapsed. And this was in a time when all of Christendom was Catholic. What did all of this mean to our two heroes? For one thing, it is clear that Rembrandt did not see himself as an antagonist of Rubens. He took the older Flemish master as a model, not only for his art, as we have seen, but even for his personal appearance. Although there's no proof for this, I have the strong suspicion that Rembrandt visited Rubens in Antwerp in the winter of 1630 on the eve of his most striking borrowings from Rubens, including the self-portrait and the etching on the right, a year after the self-portrait by Rubens was published in the same form. <laughs> a look at the backgrounds of the two artists reveals that they were cousins in art. Rubens' most important teacher was the Dutch artist Otto van Veen, van Veen who had studied with Isaac Klaas van Swanenburg whose son and pupil Jacob was Rembrandt's first master. Both von Fein and Jacob von Swanenburg worked for long periods in Italy. Jacob became a Catholic there. Otto had patrons in high positions in the church and fulfilled Catholic commissions in Italy, France, and Flanders. And this is an illustration of that mixture through uh, the art world, through society, through families that I told you about at the beginning. As for Rubens, although no one would doubt his devotion to Catholicism, he was born to a Calvinist father and a Lutheran mother and did not become a Catholic until the age of 12 when his mother underwent a conversion to Catholicism that was certainly opportune and perhaps opportunistic. 
And Rembrandt seems never to have become a member of a church. If we look for indications of personal confession in his autonomous work rather than commissions, we find them more on the Catholic than the Protestant side. Take, for example, this etching of the Madonna and Child. In the paintings we've looked at, Rembrandt painted Mary on Golgotha undergoing decidedly human emotions. This is in keeping with the Calvinist rule of honoring Mary without worshiping her. His etching of the Madonna, inspired by a print by the Italian Catholic artist Federico Barocci that Rembrandt owned, flaunts this rule. It is a clear deification of the Madonna of a kind that no committedly Calvinist artist would ever have made. The same applies to this virgin and child after Montaigne. Although Rembrandt placed the virgin in a bourgeois interior, he provides her with an even larger halo than Montaigne. One could say in this case that the image-making power of Catholic iconography was so overwhelming that Rembrandt was responding more to the art than to its meaning. But that cannot be said of Rembrandt's portrait of his 18-year-old son Titus as a Franciscan monk, which expresses personal sympathy with Catholic monasticism. All the more when we take into consideration that there was a clandestine Franciscan monastery at the end of the street where Rembrandt lived from 1639 to 1660. This painting was made in the very year when the artist and his family left for the other side of town. What I think this shows is that even when we find markers of Protestant belief in Rembrandt's work, we cannot take them as evidence for his exclusive devotion to Reformed Christianity. That is a big difference with Rubens and Catholicism. Even in his commissions for Catholic churches, we sense a complete personal commitment in Rubens to the message of the work. A few minutes ago, when we looked at this comparison, I suggested that Rembrandt may have seen the original altarpiece after which Forsterman's print was made. The comparison of his painting with that of Rubens is illustrated in art history books and in slide lectures like this. That, however, does not do justice to the case. Let me show you what the two paintings look like in proper size scale. Rembrandt's painting could be fit 25 times into Rubens's. And size is not the whole story. Rubens's vast painting is the central panel of a triptych made for the altar of the Antwerp Acrobacias Guild in the cathedral. The side panels of the open triptych show the visitation, Mary visiting her equally present pregnant cousin Elizabeth, and the presentation in the temple. The themes are related in more ways than one. They represent not only the beginning and the end of the incarnation, but also show the three bearers of Christ. The virgin carrying him in her womb, Simeon raising him in his arms, and the cross holding him up. To us, this might seem a bit far-fetched, but not to Antwerp worshipers of the time. They will have known that the patron saint of the Antwerp Guild of the Archibusiers was St. Christopher, whose very name means bearer of Christ. Indeed, the left outside wing of the altarpiece has a monumental St. Christopher based on a Michelangelo model. <clears throat> the idea of bearing Christ, therefore, carries over from the outside panels of the altarpiece, which you see when it's closed, to the inside, this interpretation was actually published as early as 1771. The hermit with his lantern amplifies the meaning of these very physical scenes <coughs> by showing in the words of Simon Shama, the transformation of weight into pure celestial light.
Here is a photo I took in Antwerp Cathedral during an historical exhibition in 2013 in which some 50 altarpieces, most of them now in museums, were hung on the locations in the church where formerly they or altarpieces like them were displayed. Rubens's descent is in the distance over here. As you can see from this photo, and can now know from what I have told you about its iconography, we are not dealing only with pictures and not only with display. These are objects that have a sacred liturgical function related not only to the church and to worship, but also to a local civic body and its place in the consecrated space of the Virgin's house. Having told you how Rembrandt's descent was financed by the piracy money, spiking the personal fortune of the richest man in the Netherlands, let me ask your attention for the interesting story of how Rubens's was paid for. It starts 50 years earlier, on the 21st of August in the year 1566. On that day, a mob of Protestant iconoclasts stormed Antwerp Cathedral and tore down its statues and pictures of saints and of Christ and Mary. In their view, these images were being worshipped by the Catholic faithful. They were objects of idolatry. Not until 1585 did the Spanish Catholic authorities regain control of the city. One of the projects they initiated to restore the old order was to encourage church wardens, clergymen, monastic orders, chapters, guilds, and other corporations to replace the lost church furnishings with new ones. Many succeeded, but not the arquebusiers. Theirs was not a trade guild with prosperous members. It was made up of male citizens who served in the civic guard, many of whom were of the genteel poor. Under continuing pressure from the cathedral chapter, they came up with an inventive method for raising the 8,000 guilders needed for an altarpiece for the expensive frame as well as the canvases. They requested and received permission from the city government to capitalize on the evasion of civic duties. All citizens were required by law or custom to fulfill a certain number of responsibilities. The arquebusiers succeeded in gaining permission to offer, quote, perpetual exemption from watch duty as also from all duties within the same guild and also from the duties of church warden, borough warden, and dean of their craft, and further from all service under the banners of the city militia. Each of these individuals would be required to pay a major sum of what was in effect ransom money 400 guilders and an annual payment of three or four guilders more. This provided more than half of the costs. The rest was raised in various other forms of funding, members' fees, municipal subsidies, donations. So that by the time Rubens received the commission, all of Antwerp felt like it owned the altarpiece. He too contributed by accepting delayed payment not receiving the final installment until February 11th, 1621. The altarpiece remained in the church for which it was made from 1614 until today, except for a decade when it was in Paris, having been taken off by Napoleon. The descent is talked about in all the travel memoirs, guidebooks, and books on Rubens from the time of its creation. The contrast with the origins and fortunes of Rembrandt's descent from the cross can hardly be greater. That painting was one of seven commissioned from him by the stadtholder Friedrich Hendrik von Nassau, Prince of Orange. They were made for the private delectation of the prince and his guests in private palace quarters. The earliest reference to them in the account book states from 1668, when they belonged to the widow of Frederick Hendrik. The following mention is from 1716 in the inventory of Johann Wilhelm, Elector Palatinate in Dusseldorf. 
From there, they pass down to the Alta Pinacothek in Munich, where they still hang. No one knows where they were or who owned them between 1668 and 1716. Knowing what we now know, we can second the conclusion of the Rembrandt Research Project that, quote, Rembrandt's version has a strongly narrative character compared to the devotional emphasis in Rubens's altarpiece, evident also in the prominent placing of the crown of thorns on a dish. So this adds to the liturgical meaning of, of the painting as opposed to the storytelling. <coughs> Dear ladies and gentlemen, as you may have been saying to yourselves, Christ cannot have been lowered from the cross without having been raised there first. In contrast to the descent from the cross, which is spoken of in scripture, the elevation is not. It was depicted sporadically in art from around 1500 on, but artists were freer to interpret it as they will. There was disagreement about the mechanics of the operation, was Christ nailed to the cross before it was raised on the ground, or was he affixed to a standing cross? Did Rubens and Rembrandt also depict that event? And if so, how? They did indeed. And once more, we're confronted with the same vast difference in scale and function as in the descents from the cross. The story of the Rembrandt is the same as for his descent made for the prince. But that of Rubens is different and again much more interesting. The commission for this painting was given to Rubens not long after he returned to Antwerp from Italy where his career had an auspicious start. But the very first commission he received at that time deserves our attention and I'll show it to you now not only because it's one of the treasures of the Prado but also because it is the logo for the entire series of lectures where we are this evening. And now I pass the microphone to my absent colleague, Alejandro Fergara. Uno de los cuadros eh, que tiene el Prado de Rubens, que tiene una historia más interesante, es la Gran Adoración de los Magos, el mayor de los cuadros de Rubens que tiene el museo. Es un cuadro pintado originalmente por Rubens en 1609, por encargo de la ciudad de Amberes, regalado por la ciudad a un emisario español unos pocos años después, enviado a España, confiscado más adelante por el rey Felipe IV, e instalado en su colección, donde Rubens se lo encuentra durante un viaje a Madrid 20 años después de haberlo pintado. Y es por lo tanto un cuadro especialmente interesante para que podamos intentar entender qué es lo que el pintor decidió cambiar de una imagen que él mismo había pintado 20 años antes, en el momento en el que él se la encuentra 20 años después. Si se mira el cuadro con cuidado en la sala, se puede ver que en la parte superior y en la parte derecha hay grandes franjas añadidas, esos son... Eh, porciones de pintura que Rubens añade al cuadro para hacerlo más grande de lo que era originalmente. Si miramos en la parte superior derecha, montado sobre un caballo blanco, hay una figura que mira hacia atrás, hacia el centro de la escena. Es un autorretrato del propio Rubens, el único que pintó de sí mismo dentro de una escena que trata de otra cuestión. Rubens eh, se retrata a sí mismo con una cadena de oro, que era un elemento que se recibía como regalo de príncipes y por lo tanto era una señal de distinción especial. Se retrata a sí mismo también con una espada al cinto, también un elemento eh, de uso restringido en la época y para el cual los príncipes y los reyes tenían que dar un permiso especial y por lo tanto Rubens una vez más se está retratando, llamando la atención sobre el estatus especial del que él disfruta. Thank you, Alejandro. When the painting was still in Antwerp and in its original form, Rubens had an engraving made after it by the Dutch printmaker Lucas Forstermann. Rembrandt knew this model very well and made use of it in various ways. In his most tender appropriation of a Rubens motif, Rembrandt made this drawing. As summary as Rembrandt's brush drawing is, 
it is non and nonetheless provides us with a very instructive comparison for our inquiry. The print is inscribed with a privilege extended by the Spanish crown, suggesting that it was already known that the painting after which it was made was destined for the Spanish royal collection. This adds an essential dimension to the meaning of the image. Rubens' Christ child, God himself, let us not forget, is laying his hand on the head of the oldest magus, who in Christian exegesis is called a king. A passage from Psalm 72:11 underpins that interpretation. May all kings fall down before him. Seen in this light, the act depicted resembles the ordination of a king, expressive of the divine right bestowed on him by God. This doctrine surely appealed to Philip IV, who was now the king of Spain. Rubens also gives the scene a heavy-going theological connotation. The infant Christ stands on a wooden barn platform covered with straw. This is an obvious allusion to a motif made famous by Rubens in the same decade called Christ a la Paille, Christ on a bed of straw. In his painting of the subject, here in a print after it, Rubens even used the same model for Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea as in the Adoration of the Magi, this figure. The baby Jesus of the Adoration is therefore already on the offer block, a sacrifice made by God for the redemption of man. Rembrandt takes on none of these meanings. What he sees in the constellation is a pious, modest old man paying his respects to a child to whom he's been sent. Studying the Rubens, Rembrandt noted that the posture of the Christ child standing on his own with only the slightest support from his mother is inconceivable for a newborn baby. He lets Mary hold Jesus in the way all of us have enjoyed so much, having him stand on her knees uh, making his mother hold him firmly while she lets him bend over trustingly and adding to his weight. <clears throat> to put it simply, for Rubens, the imagery serves the outside purposes of politics and dogma. For Rembrandt, it stands more for itself. When Rembrandt, when Rubens took on a commission for a depiction of the scene in, from the Gospels, he was subject to constraints of all kinds. If there was an altarpiece, he was expected to conform to the rule that the central panel be a depiction of Christ, the Madonna, or the saint to which the altar was dedicated. More than that, he was guided by explicit instructions from, quote, the doctors of the Counter-Reformation. I can do no better than to quote Simon Shama from his book, Rembrandt's Eyes. The foreman of Catholic Europe, quote, wanted to use images to create a Biblia pauperum, a Bible for the poor and illiterate. They were, oh, wait a second. Oh, I've lost the, uh, the text. Hmm. They were helpfully forthright about what was required. In the first place, the picture had to be perfectly clear. There couldn't be any uh, doubts uh, about its meaning, no uh, kind of hidden, abstruse subject matter. Uh, but it also had to appeal to the emotions of the audience. And these were put into words in manuals uh, of art that were uh, uh, well known to all artists and certainly to Rubens. Now, if you recall, the triptych of the descent from the cross had three different scenes, the visitation on the left, the descent in the middle, and the presentation in the temple on the right. This was a traditional way of mounting a triptych, but Rubens was not happy about it. He would rather create a single composition across the entire breadth of an altarpiece on a single plane, not separated by the joints of a triptych. 
That is the way he returned to the composition in the 1630s in an oil sketch for another of those engravings after a painting. The mise-en-scene comes far closer to the aim of engaging the viewer. It creates a space that looks accessible, that brings you yourself to Golgotha. If in the image of the Virgin and Child with baby Jesus, Rembrandt abided closer to physical facts than Rubens, in the elevation of the cross, the opposite is the case. Rubens asked himself and made the viewer aware of just how much effort is demanded to raise upright a cross with the body of a man. Bare-chested, sweating, workers are struggling with the help of a Roman soldier and an oriental dressed in red to pull or, depending on the location, push the cross up in our direction. A heavy rope is tied to the top of the cross with one of the men tugging at it with all his strength. A heavy rope is tied, um, yeah, as Simon Schama has pointed out, the church of St. Valburga, for which the painting was made, lay on the Antwerp docks. Rubens's models were likely to have been seamen for whom the raising of a cross would have been like hoisting a mainsail. The painting was, in fact, so large that it could only be painted in place with the impromptu atelier closed off from the rest of the church with a ship's sail. The congregants in the church who saw all this happening were drawn into the action both of making the painting and raising the cross. The sensation of involvement is accentuated by the shallow stage on which the scene is taking place. The base of the cross is at the very front edge of the picture plane. When the task is achieved, the cross will tower over us. In Rembrandt's elevation of the cross, four men are engaged in the effort, two of them barely visible. Yet here, too, a close association is achieved between the faithful event and the viewer. It is a much quieter and more personal tie than in the overwhelming Rubens. In the full light of the center of the composition, one of the men performing the execution of Jesus is none other than Rembrandt himself, with his bulbous nose and curly red hair, the more recognizable for all those self-portraits that were in circulation. The insertion into scenes of the passion of an image of the artist had become something of a vogue in Italian art in the 16th century. However, in those works, the artist almost always inserts himself in the sympathetic role of a follower of Christ at the lamentation, the deposition, or the entombment. The most famous example is Michelangelo's self-portrait as Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea in a pieta he intended for his own grave. He abandoned the statue in a rage. His death mask was used by his friend Daniele da Volterra for a bronze head. <clears throat> Simon Schama, but there is no precedent for a self-portrait which drew attention to his own presence simultaneously as the maker of the work of art, as indicated by the beret. Where is it? No, I'm not getting there and the instrument of providence, the fulcrum of the cross. Extraordinary as this was, it shouldn't be taken as the artist blasphemously imposing himself on the scripture. Instead of intruding himself into the sacred space, Rembrandt was attempting to do something like the opposite, namely immersing himself as completely within it as all those who wrote about history painting advised." End quote. It is there that, with all their differences, all the incompatibility of their notions about the function of art in relation to faith, Rubens and Rembrandt meet. They are both deeply committed Christian rhetoricians of the brush. Neither of them needed the prescripts of the church or the recommendations of handbooks to tell them that their art had to spark the emotions of the viewer in order to achieve its purpose. And they knew that their main instrument in order to make that happen 
beside their artistic skill were their own emotions. How is that? Rubens and Rembrandt were both also admirers of and competitors with the painters of ancient Greek, Greece and Rome. Both were known to the, uh, they were using, especially Rubens models, uh, depending on classical models. And we haven't been talking about style, but even in images as close to each other as these two bodies of Christ, you can see how Rubens was aspiring to classical monumentality, and Rembrandt was allowing his Christ to uh, fall down in the flesh and in all the weakness of his humanity. This is the recommendation made to uh, artists in order to bring over onto viewers the uh, greatest emotion possible. It was to feel it by themselves. So we would have a model, a story like the crucifixion, in which the emotions of the figures involved were built into the narrative. The artist, thinking about it, internalizing it, would feel it on his own, and then passing it on to the uh, uh, viewer. If Rubens did not put his own face into his passion paintings, he did not have to. Who can doubt that he was moved to the core in imagining and imaging the death of Christ? Allow me to call in for the final word another artist who observed this process in himself, an artist you might not think of in these terms. In an interview with Selden Rodman in the 1960s, Mark Rothko made this unexpected and rather aggressive statement about his art. I'm interested only in expressing basic human emotions, tragedy, ecstasy, doom, and so on, and the fact that lots of people break down and cry when confronted with my pictures show that I communicate those basic human emotions. The people who weep before my pictures are having the same religious experience I had when I painted them. And if you, as you say, Broadman, are moved only by their color relationships, you're missing the point. One could think that there was an essential difference between Rubens and Rembrandt on one hand and Rothko on the other, and that they were putting their artistic powers and emotional capabilities to work in the service of divine worship. But Rothko says basically the same by calling in his feelings as an artist and those of his viewers a religious experience. The last word is his. Thank you.